Faith Bible Church, I'm Paul Dahlbeck III, for anyone out there who doesn't know, you all know me. Um, Sue thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> Shelly said, you're crazy, man. Um, and, anyway, uh, I'll try and stay sane while, sane while I'm teaching. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another precious day of your grace. Another day where we can reach out to the lost and edify the saved and encourage one another. Another day that we can experience the life of Christ in us and as we're available to Him, that He'll express His love and His truth out of us. I pray your Holy Spirit will be the real teacher this morning, Father, and that you would receive all the glory, honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So praise God, we got her safe. That's a lot of snow out there, eh? Uh, I thank God for uh, traveling mercies. So um, let's jump right into this. Again, it's the name of the message is Freedom in Christ. Jacob, could you give me some to drink, please? Um, let's go to Romans 6 6. I got it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. He's got it, Chuck. Appreciate that, brother. Look at that. Prepared. Romans 6 6. Paul tells us the Holy Spirit actually through Paul tells us knowing this we need to Paul wants us to know something right and he's writing to believers this isn't an unbeliever knowing this that our old man that's that sin nature who we were in Adam is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now some people take this verse because the way it's in this translation, it says that the sin might, sin might be destroyed. Um, I want to show you, uh, you know, what does uh, the pastor always say, compare scripture with scripture, right? So you, you learn the meaning. This doesn't mean the sin nature isn't there. The idea in the Greek is its power has been broke over us. That sin nature. Um, Go to Hebrews 2.14 and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Hebrews 2.14 And the writer of Hebrews says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, talking about Christ, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy, see there's that word, destroy him, talking about Satan, that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, is is the devil still around? Yeah. Yeah. See, it's the same thing that destroyed it back to Romans. Um, that it says, let me read it again, and then we can think it through. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Um, so, it, that's a wonderful truth. If you look at uh, Romans, the first uh, few verses, Paul tells us we die with Christ, we're buried with Christ, and we rose with Christ, right? And so the cross, we have redemption through his blood, right? The forgiveness of sins. So the cross, his blood brought forgiveness, didn't it? But when you see here, the cross broke the power of sin. And a lot of believers don't know that. You know that? They're trying to struggle with sin on their own strength and... uh, um, this is a wonderful freeing truth that we've been delivered from the dominion of darkness, right? The kingdom of darkness. 
And the moment we trusted in Christ and placed into the kingdom of light, right? God transferred us. And so, um, go to verses 9 through 14. Romans 6, verses 9 through 14. Let me take a drink of water. Again, <laughs> you see Paul knowing. you got to know some stuff. How do you get to know these truths? Bible study, right? You study the Word on your own. And then you come and... I like uh, how the pastor mentioned it the one time. I had heard it from somebody else and, I, and then the pastor brought another sort of picture in my mind. I had heard when you come to church, the doctrine you've been studying during the week, you've been filling your soul up with, it stirs it up. And then I like the pastor. He said it brings it to animation in your life. That's why I think it's important to come and assemble together. You know, there's some grace believers that don't think it's that important. To me, it is. Because not only are you hearing the word um, preached, we all, I believe, have inward spiritual gifts and we encourage each other. You know, the fellowship, you know. um, Because sometimes we think we're the only ones struggling with stuff. You know? And when, when you, if you go to Grace Church, you can be honest. You know, if you go to legalist for church, everybody's faking. Like, hey, I got it all together. You know, I'm, I walk in holy and moly. You know, and, um, but we can be honest with each other. We all struggle. You know, because Paul says, "What I want to do, I don't do. What I, what I don't want to do, I do." And you know, and he was struggling. Actually, I think Paul learned a lot of things. Um, from from Christ and then in his own experience that <clears throat> when he tried to perform in his own strength in his flesh what did he say? Oh wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of sin? Have you been there? I have. Um, you know, I used to be under legalism and what was that one answer for that? Praise be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Christ is always the answer for every problem we have. You know, God's grace is uh, sufficient. If you're not struggling, you're probably in reverse. <laughs> there you go. Uh, for those who didn't hear it, boy, he said, if you're not struggling, you're probably... You're probably in reversion. In reversion. That's the first time I heard that one, reversion. Yeah, and yeah. if we're not moving forward, usually we're not going to be just stopped. We're, we'll be moving backwards. Uh, and I love just Paul's encouragement when he said one thing I do and he learned these things I forget the past and I press on right I think of the Olympics with when they got their chest out to hit that yellow or whatever that ribbon is um, <clears throat> and that's what what God when we mess up and you know sometimes you know every day I always say we come up short where's Bill when the uh, <laughs> when we walked in, I thought that was Bill walking in. Um, he loves it when I say come up short. He keeps going like this, you know, my side. But we all come up short every day. Um, but some days seems like uh, it's it's a, ah, here you go. Here's I'm short, and he opens up the back door. Um, but some days it seems like you know maybe you're really getting hit by the enemy, you know. And that's where it's so important to realize that forget the past, right? And press on in Christ's strength. So um, let's go, oh, 9 to 14. You got to know something. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. So Christ isn't going to die again. It's finished, right? It's completed. What he, his purpose for his death, um, he finished his his goal. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Christ when he said for the joy, yeah, he endured. I'm trying to think of the verse exactly. Even death on the cross, Christ knew his purpose, why he came. Um, and you know, I think about us. Do we know our purpose? while we're here. Yeah. And I think 
our purpose is worship, Romans 12.1. In view of God's mercies, His loving kindness, His grace, I think, um, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable, logical act of service or divine worship that can be translated. So uh, that's what our purpose is. So we can have joy just to be available to God and say, Lord, you know, like when they called me last night, you know, um, I always say I'm like, there used to be a daily pay place called Ready Man. And, you know, I'm always uh, available, you know, because I don't depend on myself. But I do stay in the Word. So when you're in the Word, you're pouring it in you and then it's going to pour out to those around you. So we got to know some things, right? So verse uh, 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died on the sin once. And then that he liveth, he lived to God. So Christ died once, right? Death has no more dominion over him. He rose from the grave, right? Victorious over this world, sin, Satan. And Satan don't like us to know that, right? He doesn't want us to know we're free. We're free from him. We're free from, um, as we apply these truths to our lives, we're free from the course of this world. Um, you know, he doesn't, he wants us to think we're in, you know, he's more powerful than he is, I think. But what Jesus say, you'll know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Are you here to um, be built up in the truth today? You want to be free in your life? Amen. Amen, I do. I thank God for his words so much. So here, all right, he died. He died on the sin once, and that he liveth, he liveth on the God. Likewise, reckon, that idea of reckon is to count... Um, Count is true. If you go back to uh, the first verses in this chapter, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And you know, you'll get accused of that if you teach grace, right? Oh, you're just saying I could just go kill somebody, right? And uh, it, it won't matter, that greasy grace, right? And I'll go, do you want to kill somebody? Is the only reason you're not because you think God's going to get you? I don't want to kill anybody, do you? You kind of flip them around on them, right? Um, but that's a fleshly response to grace. Um, and what's Paul say? God forbid or never, never, never. How shall we that are dead to sin live in it any longer? Live under its influence. Know ye not that as many as us were baptized, what's that word mean? identified or placed into. Um, the King James translators, they didn't translate this word. They, what do they call it? Uh, transliterated. Transliterated it. Um, so, because they kind of believed in um, baby baptism and things like that and uh, the religion in, over in England. But anyway, the idea there, if you go to the Greek, were baptized, placed into, identified, in the Christ Jesus, where I, we're baptized or identified, placed into his death. So the moment we bleed, God identified us, the Holy Spirit placed us into Christ's death, his burial, and we rose with Christ. And Now, what else did we do with Christ? We ascended with Christ, right? He's seated high above all principalities, powers, and mights, dominions, right? And we're uh, Ephesians 2, 7, I think, or 6. We're seated with Him in the heavenly places. You say, how's that? He's there, I'm here. Because our union with Christ. We have oneness. We're fused together with Him. This happened one time. That's what. This is what God did, the Holy Spirit did. What... Um, happened because what Christ did. Know ye not that as many as us were baptized or placed into Christ were baptized into his death? See, we died with him. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism and in the death. So we were placed in the tomb with him. Why? Because that's what you do with the dead person who we were in Adam. And you leave them there, right? They never come back. Adam will never resurrect in us. 
that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now, um, this is why I like going to Greek so much, the original language that God breathed, because that word life is Z-O-E, it's Zoe. It's a quality of life. It's called spiritual life. It's the same type of life God has. We have God's DNA. <laughs> yeah, I got a thing. You might have seen that on uh, Facebook. I had a DNA test. God is my father. Yeah. Um, we're, our union with Christ is such a precious truth. I didn't... Uh, when I first got saved... You know, uh, most of you know I was in a legalistic Pentecostal church. And I was trying so hard. I would walk the aisle every week, when, you know, they tell you come up and recommit your life to the commitment you broke last week. And I remember laying in bed saying, God, I'm sick of trying to live this Christian life. If it's going to get done, you're going to have to do it. And I think he was just smiling, saying, you're finally getting it. See, God can work all things for our good, right? Romans 8, 28. Because that broke me, trying. And then I, I started, when I was at that point, it's a terrible thing, because I just felt condemned by God. He's mad at me, he didn't like me, um, you know, uh, disgusted with me. Um, so that's not such a good thing. But what it did, it made me appreciate when I heard my identity in Christ. When I started learning how to rightly divide the word, and who I was as a new creation in Christ, a new creature in Christ. Um, that's such good news. See, when, when I think some of the best teachers or preachers are those who've been under legalism and been set free from it. Um, I never, and I always pray, God, let me never get apathetic about your grace. Do you remember, you remember Bob George, right? Boy, I asked him one time, uh, uh, he's who I started learning the difference of law and grace and the finale of the cross, the reality of the resurrection. And I asked him, you need prayer for anything, Bob? And he said, yeah, that I don't get apathetic about God's grace. And I pray that about myself. You know, just, uh, you know, I never want to come to church and go, <sighs> yeah, grace, grace, grace. Yeah, um, I want to be passionate. That's why I think when I when I teach, I stay passionate because I appreciate it. Uh, God's grace so much. So back to um, let's go to Ephesians four twenty two to twenty four. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24. Well, it would help me to get in Ephesians rather than Galatians, wouldn't it? <laughs> These would be looking at me like, what are you talking about? Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. And it would help me to get out of Philippians. That's right. It's right in between that. I don't use this Bible that much, so the pages kind of stick together. Now, Paul, it's the same truth that uh, he's talking about in Romans 6. Um, you know how people give... A new believer, a lot of time, churches will give them the Gospel of John when they trust in Christ. They should give them Romans. Romans is a handbook of salvation. You know, you see eternal security there. But also in Romans, you see the mechanics of the Christian life. It's all the basis for what Paul builds everything else on. Um, so he says, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt, according to deceitful lust. Um, you see, that sinful nature is always there, and Paul actually well, tells us that it is it gets slicker in your life. You know, because sometimes you're, you're learning things, you're growing, 
So it gets a little bit more subtle where it tries to get them claws in. And he says, put it off. And, well, if you're going to put it off, then what do you do? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What does Paul tell us in uh, uh, Romans 12? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. How, how is your mind renewed? Through God's word. Because that's where God speaks to us. And it, the word of God, it energizes us. It works in us. You know? And that's how God, he's working in us through his word to what? It's God who both, um, who's working in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And he says, be renewed in your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Um, so you see, the old man is just corrupt. That sin nature, um, till the rapture, it's, it's in these bodies. Okay, It's not that your body is evil. Because God says offer your body as a living sacrifice, right? But until the rapture, there's a sin nature. And there's that struggle. Um, you ever notice when you want to get in the Bible study and things, you start thinking about other things. You got to do this. You got to do that. Yeah, that's the flesh. Because, you know, God's word is light, right? It's light. And it will expose where the flesh is trying to hold, have them little holes. You know? um, and so the flesh don't want to be exposed. It wants to be uh, corrupt. You know? But praise God, he shows us, and not to condemn us, he wants to free us, right? And we need to know our identity in Christ. Because you look at there, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Um, what is... Uh, Paul tell us that he who knew no sin, Christ, became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. If you're a believer, you're the righteousness of God in who you are inwardly as the new creation. But like I said, we're housed in old bodies. That's why I look so forward to the rapture. Uh, one thing, no more pain, right? Now, Mary probably with her leg and things back in me, you know, uh, I got some, but I look forward to it for that too, but there won't be that struggle. All we'll do for eternity is just want to serve Christ. There won't be that struggle. But, this is the only time, Kirk, would you say this, while we're on this earth, that we can glorify God like probably not, we won't even be able to do in heaven because with that struggle, in our weakness, what Christ's power is made manifest, right? So, you know, when people see Christ in us, working in us, do us, that's a testimony to they see his resurrected life in us. You know, that's why we want to apply this word. It's not just, you know, even James said, you know, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer, you know. Um, and that, I think that's trans dispensational. God always wants us to do His will. You know, uh, the thing is, under grace, He's not punishing us if we don't. But He desires us to, because you know why? God's will is always the best, isn't it? Remember, Father Knows Best, the TV show for all you oldies but goodies? Father Knows Best. God's will is always good. Yeah, and and he wants us to be rejoicing, right? Rejoice, Paul said again. I say rejoice, right? The Lord is near. And I, when I look at that, I think, well, one thing, he's near, he's in us by his spirit, right? But also, you keep life in perspective as you look for the rapture because you're thinking of the eternal, eternal things, you know. And we're going to go one day. And so that's why Paul says, redeem the time, you know, while we're here. Um, Let's go Colossians 3, 8 and 9, or 9 and 10, I'm sorry. Colossians chapter 3. If I could get to it with this Bible. Colossians 3, 
9 and 10. Lie not to one another, seeing that, listen to this, she have put off the old man with his deeds. When did, you, when did that happen? The moment you trusted in Christ. Your old man was crucified. That's in nature. You, we're no longer in Adam. Sometimes we act like, you know, you say, well, I'm not doing the things I used to. Uh, do you ever, I'll ask women, do you ever disrespect your husband? Get a little cocky or loud with them. Or husbands, do we love our wives all the time? See, we, sometimes we don't act like it. That's why it's so wonderful to understand God's grace and forgiveness, right? That we live in forgiveness. And so he says, why not to one another? Well, why not? Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And listen to this. And that put on a new man. That's who we are. Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of, of him that created it. So again, Paul's reminding us, have our minds renewed, right? Because God keeps reminding us of who we are in Christ. As, as you study Paul's epistles, because you won't find the body of Christ out, you won't find the church called the body of Christ outside of Paul's epistles, will you? I bet somebody a hundred, a thousand dollars. And they'll say, oh, there's a church. Oh, yeah, there's churches. Uh, in Acts, Stephen said the church in the wilderness, right? Or Christ talked about, I'll build my um, church on this rock. That was a kingdom church that believed that Christ was Messiah and King, right? That See, there's church, but not the body of Christ. Because it wasn't until Paul, Christ saved Paul, in Acts chapter 9, that the body of Christ began. What does Paul say in 1 Timothy? That he was saved as a pattern for those who would believe after, right? So, we find Paul... And in his epistles, that whole body of truth that's to the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace, right? You know how blessed you are to know that? You know in, ch- in church this morning, you know where most churches are going to be? Either the Old Testament, or you get a little Pentecostal, you'll be in the bo- book of Acts, early Acts, you know, signs and wonders. Um, or... There'll be in uh, a whole lot of churches. Will be in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and that's cool to teach from there. If you teach that that Christ, He said, "I didn't come to do it away with the law, but to fulfill it." Right. So in His early ministry, He was born of a virgin, born under the law, and He's teaching under the law. So when you're reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, now if you read it in context and know it's it's profitable, right? But if you think them instructions are to you in the body of Christ, you're going to be confused. Because what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, I think 37? I give you the commands of Christ. So in the dispensation of grace, why do you think I'm in these uh, Paul's epistles this morning? Though I study the whole Bible, because we should. You don't just study Paul's epistles. But just know the context like when you're uh, studying Genesis or Exodus, Leviticus, what's the context? It's about the nation of Israel and the law, right? Um, and Exodus. Anyway, uh, let's go to Galatians 5, 18. A couple books back. Galatians 5.18 We're going to go to 18 first and then uh, 16 for your notes. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under law. So is the Spirit leading us to be under law? According to Paul. No, right? He's never leading us on the law because God only gave the law to Israel. (laughs) In the dispensation of grace, you get yourself under the law, it's going to fan the flesh. Paul says that the power of sin is in the law. 
the law will say do this or don't do that, right? And fear is the motivation on the law. If you do this, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you, right? That's a law. So it's, it actually, what's a rebel do when you tell him don't do something? He does it, right? So the law will fan your flesh. That's why the Holy Spirit never leads us on the law. So those who are teaching this morning from pulpits, because Satan does his best work behind the pulpit, right? Because uh, religion sounds so good to the flesh. I can perform, you know. I can uh, make myself acceptable to God through these ceremonies or whatever, baptism or whatever. Different churches say different things, right? Um, traditions of men. And so, Paul says, we're not on the law if we're led by the Spirit. Then verse 16. So if we're not on the law, then how are we going to serve God and live a life that adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> verse 16. This I say then, Walk in the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill lust of the flesh. So instead of saying, God, how can I stop sinning this sin? Start saying, Lord, teach me to walk in the Spirit. And you won't fulfill lust of the flesh. You see how that's different from legalism and grace? Satan's so subtle, man. You know, he, he and his ministers of what I think Paul is being sarcastic, righteousness transformed, well, they transform themselves in the minister of righteousness. So you got a lot of people up in the pulpit. That's why I always tell people, test what I'm teaching by the word of God, but rightly divided. <laughs> you know, because you go in uh, back to Exodus and Moses is telling them to keep the law, right? Well, is he telling you that? No, the Spirit's not leading you there. Satan likes to get people in bondage. Actually, he uses the law as a condemnation tool. Yeah. Um, and when you think of law, you think of, I think of legalism, right? We can put ourselves under our own legalism, you know that? Our, we, like our performance standards... Like you think, man, I've been studying God's Word. I understood, understand grace. How come I'm getting depressed? Well, we all struggle. Satan's attacking, right? Live in this fallen world. And, but the wonderful thing about staying in the Word is that it renew, it, God reminds us again. Yeah. I, I find when I start getting down, because I... Uh, I went through a real bad depression in my 20s. I mean, I just wanted to die for months. I kept thinking, I just want to die. It was like a black hole with no light at the top. And I thought from doing the drugs when I was younger, my mind's gone. And I know that wasn't really me, because nobody really wants to die. What was it? Satan, an attack, you know, he attacks from without, right? Um, so it's like... <coughs> I realized something. What does Paul tell us in Philippians 4, you know, 4 to 6 or 4 to 8? Um, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with what? With thanksgiving. Make your request be made known to God. Then what happens? The peace of God that passes all understanding will protect your mind and your heart, your thoughts, your emotions. So when I start getting kind of down, because usually I'm thinking about my problems or things in this world, looking at, you know, getting stressful and getting anxious. And I realized, God, I know it's why I'm not thankful. I'm not thinking about all the things I got to be thankful for. I'm not thinking I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing. I'm complete in Christ. You're working all things for my good. You know, I'm not thinking about uh, this life is going to be passed so fast. You know, like James says, like a, a puff, a vapor, right? And, and then 
what what happens? You're you're taking the word, you start applying it, and you're set free from from that. You know, so. All right, we're go to Romans eight nine eleven. You said I can go to forty five, right? Mm-hmm. Pass us that okay. Romans eight nine through eleven. Romans eight nine through eleven. Start in 8, because I want to point some out. How many times have you heard, I know I've, I've seen it, and I see it on Facebook, people think they're sharing the gospel, and they're telling people, you need to commit your life to Christ, turn from all your sins, commit your life to Christ. Well, these aren't saved people in the flesh, right? They're in Adam. Look what Paul says. So then... They that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're unsaved, you can't commit your life to God. Now when you're saved, you offer your body as a living sacrifice, right? We should, out of gratitude. But he says, But ye are not in the flesh, now talking about believers, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He is none of his. And I want to point, Scripture will always deal with error. They will expose it. I was taught in the Pentecostal, I'm not, you know, I love Pentecostals. I'm not, I'm just, that was my experience. Right? And they used, they used to say, you get Jesus, then you get, seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm always going up when it's happening, but I wouldn't fake. Like, I remember the assistant pastor laying hands on me and saying, oh, I can see the Holy Spirit all over you. Just let your tongue go. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not just, I'm not faking, you know. Um, but it was so refreshing when, when I understood I received the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians, what, 1, uh, 4, 13, 14, when we believe that gospel, you heard the gospel, you believed that what? That Christ died for my sins personally. I trusted and he was buried and he rose. I received the Holy Spirit. I was sealed with them until the day of redemption. That means we're guaranteed the rapture and going to heaven. I was completing Christ, but you know what it is? You don't know what you got in Christ when you first get saved, right? And so... What's Paul saying? If Christ be in you, in verse 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him, that's Christ, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, here's the secret. I say secret because a lot of Christians don't know about it. He that raised Christ from the dead also will quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. Look at that and think about it, and I would encourage you to meditate on that today, this week, and study that out, because it's the Holy Spirit that takes what Christ accomplished through His death, burial, and resurrection, and He makes that real in our lives as we appropriate it by faith and our experience. See, we're complete in Christ, right? Are you blessed with every spiritual blessing? Amen. If, you, if you don't know you are, better get out that word. Watch, it's sharp, but it, uh, like I like what Dave said one time, that it will fillet you open. It divides soul and spirit, right? It, it will just you know, show us things. But, you know, I, I think of uh, David in the Old Testament. Lord, examine my heart, you know. Um, a lot of things, thank God he doesn't show us everything he wants to do in us. I think we'd have a heart attack, <laughs> you know. But he takes his time, and he's patient, and he grows us. And his Spirit's working in us. And what he began in you, 
he's going to finish. So um, uh, we'll close with prayer. And I want to say, if as we're praying, I don't know who knows the Lord, who doesn't out there, who will be watching this. Um, I would encourage you just to thank God that Christ died for your sins personally. He was buried and he rose. Because the moment we trust in that and we're, we're saved, what? By grace, unmerited favor. You don't earn it. All you do is you're saved by grace through faith. Faith is trust. I believe and I, by an act of my will, I place my faith in what Christ did in his finished work. It's not of ourselves, not getting baptized, not walking now, not turn from all your sins and start going to church. Um, it's, it's a gift to God. So I would encourage you to receive that gift by faith today. Not a works so us, anyone should boast. Let's pray.